thank you so much for the kind and long introduction. And uh, I feel thank you so much for inviting me to share on a topic called Called to Serve. I can't tell you how privileged I feel to know that God has called me to serve him and his people. Psychologists for decades have been talking about the connection between having purpose in life and good health, long life, satisfaction, and all of that. Viktor Frankl in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, talks about you know, his experience of being at the Nazi death camps and during the Holocaust, and he says that what really helped him to come out alive was because he believed that he would come out alive. And one of the things that he pinned his hope on was just imagining that he would come out and give lectures. He was a psychiatrist, give lectures and talks. Uh, he was writing a book before he went into the death camp. And so he had his manuscript ready. And uh, you know, when they entered the camp, everything was stripped of them, including his manuscript. And so he says how when he was in the cell, he would think about the different uh, subjects and you know, topics that he was writing on, and he would imagine coming out and publishing. So Viktor Frankl says that what is the biggest motivational fact uh, a motivational force behind a person is their search for meaning. Most of us have read and reread the book by Pastor Rick Warren called Purpose Driven Life, right? So knowing that he has a plan for me, that he has a purpose for my life is what drew me to Christ when I was in college. And that's what makes this journey so exciting and meaningful. Discerning his call is the first step on this journey. And I want to you know, kind of tell us that it's only the first step. It's in many ways a very exciting time. It's like the time when we came to know the Lord. Some of us might have grown up in Christian homes with believing parents. Some of us might have had a road to Damascus experience. For some of us, it might have been a gradual process. So coming to know the Lord was a beginning. While it's exciting to hear of someone's story of how they came to know the Lord, it is only the first step. When I was doing my undergrad at Bits Pilani, I met a few students who would say, I studied so hard in 12th standard that now I'm going to chill. Doesn't make any sense, right? Getting college admission is just the beginning. I meet a lot of people who are stuck at this stage and uh, you know, they're saying, I don't know what God wants me to do. I'm waiting on him to see where he wants me to serve. And, and how Swarima was talking this morning during worship that when we look to him as his children, we hear his voice and he will put in our hearts the direction he wants us to, to take. I believe life is a series of seasons. When I was working in Mumbai, I used to be part of the street children ministry. When I worked in California, I was part of the group that used to serve children of prisoners. When I lived in Sarjapur over the weekends, I used to go and help children who lived in the blue tent communities. So continue to look to the Lord, and as his sheep, we will hear his voice. Towards the end of the session, I will share with you how God directed us to start the Agar, but you'd have to wait a little longer to hear that. So let's dive right into walking the path of serving God. There might be a few things in this session that you might not expect to hear in a talk called Call to Serve, but I would submit to you to hear me out and I'll pray that the Holy Spirit will lead each one of us. So let's start from the very beginning. When we read, we begin with? When we start serving, we begin with faith. Faith is a gift for me. It's very easy for me to take God at his word. But what follows faith is obedience, right? Obedience involves not only the spirit, but it involves our emotions, our body. When God calls us to do something, not only do we have to believe it in our spirit, but we have to take practical steps. And that would be a stretch a stretch not only to our faith, but our stretch to our physical body, a stretch to our emotions, a stretch to our mind and our will. 
my experience has been of hearing God's voice, stepping into the water and seeing the water parts. We read a very, very exciting incident in the book of Joshua. So if you would turn with me to the book of Joshua and we'll go to chapter 3 there. Joshua chapter 3. We read how Joshua leads the people to across the river Jordan. In Joshua 3 verse 7 it says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. And we see Joshua just following that through, right? He talks to the priest, and then when you go down to verse 13, he's telling them, and as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. We read the exciting part after that. Verse 14, so when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet, as soon as the priest who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, where the water flowing down to the sea of the Arabah was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Isn't it exciting to read how God led the people? You know, it says that Jordan was at flood stage. And when I was reading, I was thinking, wouldn't it have been a little easier for the people if it was little shallow waters? I mean, already stepping into the water takes a lot of faith, right? But at least if it was a little shallow, it would have, it would have been easier, is what we would think with our human minds, right? But truly, God asks us to step out. And when he does, it is at flood stage. After about a year of starting the agar, God put in our hearts to either move to a larger center or to start a second center. So our prayer was, Lord, give us one large hall because that's what is ideal for a Montessori preschool. And guess what? God gave us one large hall. So we went and saw this place, and um, we realized that, you know, at that point we had 30 children. We realized if we move here, we can bring in 30 more children. And it was very, very exciting. I came back, I did the math, and I said, okay, we have enough funds for six months. If we move into this place, we'll have funds only for three months but we felt very firmly in our hearts that God wanted us to move. So we signed the agreement, and a week after that, one of my friend's ex-husband, whom I've never met even till date, sent us a check, which was, which was going to cover the operating cost of the new center for an entire month. So truly, my experience has been of hearing his voice, stepping into the water, and then seeing the water parts. We are given various examples of faith in action and faith in deeds. James speaks about it very plainly, right? If you would turn with me to James chapter 2. James chapter 2 verses 14 through 20. James says, What good is it, my brothers or sisters, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, 
do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. In the me message version it says, isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? Faith and works, works and faith fit together hand in glove. Emphasis was one of the first corporates who made a donation to the Agar. And this happened before we'd completed three years, which is very unusual because most big companies, uh, you know, require that the NGOs in, in operation for at least three years before making a donation. So this was in December 2018, and we were getting ready to start our second center. We'd hired the teachers, they were going through training, we'd seen the place for the second center, getting all the material together. At that time, there was a preschool that was closing, and that was very close to one of our communities. And uh, you know, they found out that we were picking up children from the community close by, so they spoke to some of my colleagues and asked if we would like to start a center there. A couple of times, you know, the owner sent word saying we'd like to meet and, you know, see what can be done. And here I was thinking, I mean, we're just putting together the second center, right? And, uh, you know, and, you know, they're talking about another place. So anyway, one Sunday evening, I drive up to this place and saying, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm just going to go and see what happens. As soon as I walked into that space, right, I knew God was going to give that place to us. So I spoke to this couple, the owner, and I told them that, you know, we've not yet figured out how, but we believe very strongly that uh, God has set up a center here. This was in December, and they were running the preschool up until March. They were going to close it in March. So I said, okay, I can give you my word that from April, we will take it on rent. A couple of weeks after that, uh, one person who had volunteered with us just once, and she had connected, in fact, through social media, said that, you know, she called me and she said, I'm going, to, she works for Emphasis. She said, I'm going to meet the Emphasis CSR team, that's a corporate social responsibility team. You know, can you send me a proposal? Is there something that you want to uh, pitch? Uh, and immediately, I was working from home that day, so immediately I put together this proposal for the third center and sent it to her. Within a couple of weeks, the team came from Emphasis to our center to just meet with us, to see the communities that we serve. And uh, when they understood our finances, they said, you only have funds for a couple of months for your first and the second center that you're going to start. So why are you asking uh, you know, for us to support the third center? So I had to tell them that, you know, this is what God is leading us to do. And I said, I understand from, you know, your perspective as well. So if you feel more comfortable to support either the first or second center, you know, that would be absolutely fine. You know, God will bring resources for the third center. And within a few weeks, the draft MOU was going back and forth. And in the end, I was so surprised when we got the MOU for the third center. So praise God for the amazing ways in which he opens doors when we obey. So our start to the journey of serving God is faith and obedience. And during this journey, we need to constantly seek his guidance. Discerning the call to serve is like getting college admission. It's just the beginning. But on that journey, constantly seeking him for wisdom, for strength, for direction is so critical. We read how David kept inquiring of the Lord. In 2 Samuel, we'll see how the Philistines were coming up to attack the Israelites. And what does our man David do? He inquires of the Lord. And he says, Lord, will you give them to me? And God says, go, for I will hand them over to you. A few verses down, we read again the Philistines are coming up to attack the Israelites. What does David do? Again, he asks, right? He inquires of the Lord. That really touches me every time. You know, he's just won the battle. And then, you know, same, same group is coming up against him, right? But he inquires of the Lord. And the Lord tells him something that's quite strange, right? He says, don't go straight, go around, go and attack from in front of the balsam trees. And David does exactly what the Lord says. The last two years have been extremely difficult for all of us. 
Diagar serves migrant communities, and so the beginning of COVID, they were really in very bad shape. March 10th, 2020, we had to close preschools, uh, and our staff was still coming to school. Within two days, one of our teachers on the way to school saw a few of our children begging at a street corner. That broke our hearts. These were children we used to pick up from the community, bring them in, give them breakfast, lunch, and evening snacks, and do classes and activities for them. Immediately the next day, we went into the community to start giving food for our children. Um, during that time, we, you know, and then the lockdown was coming up, and we said our communities would, you know, they really struggle. They are daily wage earners, they are construction workers, they are rag pickers. And we said unless they, you know, they're able to go out to work, they won't be able to make ends meet. And so we started putting together dry ration kits for the 200 families that we were serving. So by the end of March, we were able to start distributing dry ration kits. At that time, God just brought us together, uh, the Agar, XLRI alumni, and the Bangalore Jesuits Education Society. And we formed what was called COVID Relief Bangalore, which went on to work with 50 or more NGOs and hundreds of volunteers to provide dry ration kits across the city. At that time, at the Agar, we were only 14 of us. Eight teachers, four support staff, and two of us non-teaching staff. So what we got into was something that was beyond our capacity as individuals and beyond our capacity as an organization. Through that time, I just kept looking to the Lord and saying, Lord, what do you want us to do? And he spoke so clearly saying, I've called you for such a time as this because we were already part of the migrant community. We already understood their needs and we were able to serve them. Last year, the second wave hit us like crazy, right? Now, at that, at, by that time, we had about 10 community centers, and we had about 1,500 families across these communities. So again, we started doing dry ration kit distribution. We also started doing crazy things like checking the temperature and creating isolation tents within these communities. End of April, I tested positive for COVID, and then my husband tested, got COVID as well. He never tested positive, but then he had COVID. Um, he needed oxygen support and he was hospitalized by God's grace. He came out fine. All around us, people were going into the hospital and not coming back. And when you lead an organization, the well-being and the safety of your team is the most important thing, right? And so I was just crying out to the Lord and saying, Lord, do we stay home and stay safe? Or do we go into the communities and continue serving? God spoke to me through 2 Samuel. In 2 Samuel, we'll see how David's army defeats the Ammonites. And um, Joab, Joab was sent for this uh, battle. And in verse 9, we see Joab saw that there were battle lines in front of him and behind him. And later in verse 12, he said, Be strong and let us fight bravely for our people and the cities of our God. The Lord will do what is good in his sight. That was a clear direction for me, that God was calling us to continue serving, continue serving our people, our communities, our city, and that the Lord will do what is good in his sight. So we started with looking at you know, how do we discern the call? We looked at how we step out in faith and follow it with obedience. And we said we need to constantly seek his guidance on this journey. Colossians 3 verses 23 and 24, a very, very familiar verse says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Our service needs to be marked by excellence. And why excellence? Because we serve Christ. And how can we pursue excellence? I believe only by pursuing personal growth. This might be one of the parts that comes as a surprise in a session called Call to Serve. I think it's so important for us 
to want to be the best version of ourselves. All of us have different strengths and challenges. We have to keep looking at how do we improve our skills, how do we hone our skills, and how do we equip for the areas of our challenges. Wanting to grow is difficult, right? Improving, making improvements is very difficult. And so we need to be intentional about it. With young children, we say they have growing pains. When they're like two to seven, eight, ten, you know, they wake up in the night literally crying. Uh, my son used to do that. And in common language, you say growing pains, but the doctors in this room will tell us there's nothing like growing pains, you know, just running so much during the day that it's exertion. But we know the physical pain that we go through, right, when we're trying to push ourselves, whether we're trying to run that extra kilometer, whether we're trying to do a new routine, whether we have increased the weights at the gym. When we push ourselves physically, it hurts, we get so right? But why do we continue doing it? Because we want to improve. So that's physical pain. Another more painful part is the psychological growing pains. When we reflect, when we look at ourselves, when we look at our own strengths and challenges, the good, bad, and the ugly, it can become very uncomfortable, right? But it's so important that if we want to serve with excellence, we need to pursue personal growth. Growing is not a natural process. Stephen Kotler in his books, The Art of Impossible, talks about different ways of growing, and he talks a lot about the return on investment when we read. So we can improve by reading, by listening to others, by watching, now it's all watching videos, and you know, but he talks about really how much does the author put in for a blog, or for an article and for a book, and what is our return on investment. So Stephen Kotler in his book, The Art of Impossible, says that typically it takes a reader to read a blog in about three minutes, and the author takes about three days. On an average, it's three days of work. When you look at an article, it probably takes us about 20 minutes to read an article, and that is four months of work done by the writer. When we read a book, in about five hours, we read about 10 plus years of experience research of the author. So he says, books are the most radically condensed form of knowledge on the planet. Well, that was a side note on the benefits of reading. My husband and I are big on reading and encourage our children to read. Uh, my children are now 12, nine and a half and nine, and thankfully they still read a lot. Uh, but we, one never knows, right? It's very, very challenging in this world of very many distractions. So I have digressed. So I was saying that when we want to serve with excellence, we have to pursue personal growth. In what areas do we exhibit excellence? At Diagar, we have four core principles. It's empathy, excellence, initiative, and integrity. And we're always evaluating against these four principles. For this financial year, our goal is to reach 1,000 children through about 20 to 25 centers. Also, we are looking at improving everything that we're doing. We are, we're calling it teaching excellence. So we're looking at improving our hiring of teachers, the training of teachers, the, the material that we use for teaching, the assessments, and just all of that. Everything is going through an overhaul. I worked briefly in an NGO. This was soon after I came out of being an auditor. And um, the team used to tell me, you know, we are an NGO, we are not a corporate. You can't do it this way, you know, here. They would say, don't bring the corporate culture in an NGO. And this was in response to my trying to do things excellently. But isn't that really sad? Especially when we're serving God and serving people is when we have to do things even more excellently. My colleague once said to me, and Purima has just walked in the door, <laughs> said to me that, you know, she used to work for a customer support team before she joined the Agar. And she said that her manager used to say, when you're, you know, you have to go the extra mile when you're serving a customer to make them feel happy. And so in one of our conversations, she told me, I'm so motivated to go beyond the extra mile because we are serving children and serving God through that. At the Agar, we run 
three, we ran Montessori preschool and daycare centers. So at a time when COVID happened, along with the dry ration kits, we were also sending videos to our children. We were giving them learning kits, but we were not satisfied with that, you know, because we used to take care of the children every day, provide a safe space for them, give them food and give them different activities for them to do. But here we were just sending a few videos, which only some of them could access. So by July of 2020, we started hiring women within the community, close to the community, to take classes for just five children. So they would, you know, train using the videos we sent them and use the learning kits for the children. But we were not satisfied with that. By October, we started building simple structures within the community so they could take classes. And November of last year, we started renting places once preschools were allowed to open. Last year, when we surveyed to see the different areas and different wards to see where there are more bloated communities, where these families don't have access to a government-run preschool. We came across a community near Belindor. It's behind Mantri Espana. Anybody lives in that area? Behind Mantri, near Mantri Espana? Belindor? No, okay. So there's a large community with the over 1,000 families. They come from West Bengal and from Assam. And when we went into this, community, uh, our team realized that there were over 100 preschool age children and there was no government preschool close by. Uh, and then we needed to find a place to set up our center. That's one of the very, very challenging parts because we look either for a place to rent or if there is nothing close by, then we put up a tin sheet structure like the one you see there. And so we were able to speak to the owner who subleased this land. Many times these owners don't want to give us permission to start something for the children. But by God's grace, we found favor and this person put up this Jinshi structure that we could rent. When we inaugurated the center, there was a group of people who had come, who had uh, joined us. And they are a part of a large group of voluntary uh, organization. They do a wonderful work in Bangalore in different cities and different countries. And this one person, that team, told me that, you know, we had come and seen this community, and we saw there were so many children, and we wanted to start a center for them, a preschool. So we were looking for places to rent on the main road, but we couldn't get anything. But we said we will not be able to, you know, start something within the community. So truly praise God for helping us, leading us, to serve in the way that we go the extra mile. In this case, literally go the extra mile and set up something within the community. The roads are really bad, and with the pre monsoon, and now the rains have started again. Once our van got stuck almost while it was bringing lunch, our teachers risk slipping and falling, but they do it with such a big smile because they believe they're called to serve. I'm going to go back one step. Another thing when we're looking at being excellent in our service is willing to be inconvenienced. Sometimes when we want to serve, when we say, Lord, lead me to serve, but we draw the box, right? This, but not that. Uh, this much, but not more. Um, so in this journey, that's something that I've really learned and experienced um, that, you know, he calls us to serve. He calls us to put ourselves at inconvenience for the sake of the people we are serving. At the Agar, we always want to give the best for our children. Our centers are open till about five. So before the children leave at four, they have fruit and they leave. And many people I speak to, even yesterday when I was talking to someone and telling them, they said, oh, we're so surprised that you're open till that late. Uh, because typically preschools close either half a day or maximum by three. That is a, this is actually a big inconvenience for us, especially for our team who's hiring teachers. Because most teachers, you know, want to work only till three or 3.30. But we believe that, you know, it's so important we give that child a fruit before they leave and we can keep them in a safe place as far as we can before because their parents come back late. So putting, allowing God to put you to inconvenience and really just, you know, letting yourself be inconvenienced is very, very important when we want to serve with excellence. Another area when we talk about serving with excellence is making people decisions. Who comes on on our team when we serve and who 
has to leave the team. This is one of the really hard parts, and that's some, one area that I've really been growing. The first time we had to let a teacher go was extremely difficult. I really lost sleep on it, like literally lost sleep on it. I was having you know, very, very disturbed sleep, and I was praying about it. And one morning I woke up with this impression, don't play God in her life. And that was God really clearly telling me, you know, it was time to part ways. And so, it's, you know, making these hard decisions is uh, important. People decisions are very important. Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, says it's important to get the right people on the bus, put them in the right positions, and get the wrong people off the bus. Even now when people have to move on because there is a misfit either in values or in... Um, their skills and you know what uh, is required of that role it's very very difficult uh, but God's been teaching me and uh, you know it's growing pains we talked about growing pains right it is real it is really so painful we read that in about Daniel and how he served with excellence uh, in Daniel chapter 6 verse 3 it says Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. In the message version it says, but Daniel, brimming with spirit and intelligence, so completely outclassed the other vice regents and governors that the king decided to put him in charge of the whole kingdom. Our service needs to be marked with excellence and should serve as an example of how things ought to be done. And this can be very, very overwhelming, isn't it? Yes? Yes? No. Okay. So on this journey of serving, finding our strength and encouragement in the Lord is so, so important. Uh, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Isaiah 41. So if you would turn with me to Isaiah 41. Okay, Isaiah 41, we're going to read verses 8 through 10 and then pick up a few verses after that. Isaiah 41 verse 8. But you, O Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend, I took you from the ends of the earth, from its farthest corners I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Goes on to talk about how God takes care of all our enemies and how the battle belongs to the Lord. If you would jump to verse 13, he says, For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. Do not be afraid, O worm of Jacob, O little Israel, for I myself will help you, declares the Lord. Can we say that together? The Lord himself helps us. Amen. And you know what that means? To know that the Lord himself helps us. It later goes on to say that so that people may see and know, may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this. So the Lord himself will help me. The Lord himself helps me when I have to set the vision. The Lord himself helps when we have to put the budgets together. The Lord himself helps when I have to speak to our corporate. The Lord himself helps when we are looking for an accountant. The Lord himself helps when we are so disappointed with someone because of their lack of integrity. The Lord himself helps when we are in despair, when our communities leave that space and are scattered and our the Aga children can't come to school anymore. The Lord himself helps when the owner says, no, you know, we won't give you a place. The Lord himself helps. And that means everything. That means everything. In 1 Samuel, we see how the Amalekites raided Ziklag. Remember? And uh, David and his men returned. Everything was taken away, including their wives and children. David was distraught. And it looked like the men were going to turn against him. 
David was, in verse 6, it says, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. In, amen. In the NKGV version, it says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. The message says, David strengthened himself with trust in his God. There have been many a lonely times on this journey, many disappointments, many apprehensions, many questions, many doubts, many, uh, you know, do I take this way or that way? Do I hire this person or that person? Do I promote this person or that person? Do we follow this method or that method? But truly, what has helped me has been, you know, God leading me to find strength and encouragement in him. And so on this journey, I would encourage each one of us to find our strength and encouragement in the Lord, in his word, in his presence, and in his still small voice. Okay, so 14th January 2016. I was teaching at Global School of Counseling, SABC. I was teaching a, a, one of the counseling courses. I had taken the students for a workshop at Nimhans. We were sitting in an auditorium. A slide went up which said, good is the enemy of question mark. Immediately I blurted out best. And I knew that God was speaking to me to start the NGO. That evening I went back. I didn't get a chance to speak to Shamil about it. Uh, the next morning I was back at this workshop. My husband was dropping our three children at preschool. And he messaged me saying, there are so many young children I'm seeing on the street. We should start something soon. Here I was sitting in the workshop with tears trickling down my face, knowing that God was asking us to step out and start. The next week I went to college to teach. I was teaching only one course. I was working part-time. And so I told the dean, uh, this will be the last semester I'm teaching. I don't know what we're going to do, but I know God is asking us to step out. And so truly we have seen you know, just stepping, hearing his voice, stepping into the water and seeing his goodness. Just a year before that, Shamil had quit his job and started a company. So really it was not the best time to start an NGO. Um, also in my mind I was thinking, you know, once my youngest turned six and went to full day school, we would start something. Until then I was enjoying uh, working part time and being with the children. Talk about wanting everything to be convenient, right, for us. But God had other plans. Uh, Rhea was not even three at the time, and we knew for sure that God was leading us. Uh, a couple of, two months before God spoke to us about this, we had sold some family property, and I'd got my share, and God led us to use that, so we were able to run the Agar with our personal finances for a year. Some of my close friends and family say that I have a risk-taking personality. Shamil, some of you know me well. Shamil and I have three children. Uh, three children were adopted. So when Josh was about two and a half years old, uh, you know, we had registered to adopt our second baby. And we went to uh, Kutni in Madhya Pradesh to bring home our daughter. Only thing is we came back with two daughters. So when we were there, <laughs> when we were there, and we called our family and told, my brother-in-law said, you're being very impulsive and not at all in a good way, right? Um, the amazing thing is that, again, a couple of months before that, God had spoken to us that we would have three children, uh, again, from some of the verses in Isaiah. So for us, it is really hearing his voice and stepping into the water and seeing the hand of God. When we brought our children to the pediatrician here in Bangalore, uh, the pediatrician looked at Rhea, she was only a little bit over two months, and said, you're very brave to adopt this baby because she had some history of medical complications. So for us, it's not about being brave, it's just hearing his voice and stepping out um, to serve him. Success is doing what God has called us to do and to do it the way he has called us to do. Many corporates tell us, you know, that we want to support older children. Uh, you know, we don't want to support migrant children. Will they finish preschool? Will they finish class five? Will they, you know, go into all of this, right? 
But, um, and actually, even when we were starting the Agar, those first few months, I was just talking to so many NGOs, researching online, and uh, some very well-meaning people told me, why don't you start a preschool for uh, underprivileged children, but who live in slums? So you'd actually see them graduate and go into class one and class five. You can see the difference that you are making. But for us, it was very clear that God had called us to serve communities, and these communities are ones who live in Bluton communities, are migrant communities. Many of you are very familiar with the starfish story. Yes, right? So there is a little boy uh, who's picking up starfish and throwing it into the ocean. And uh, there's an older man who sees him do this, and he comes and says, what are you doing? He says, I'm putting the starfish back in the water because you know, the tide has gone back, it's become very hot, and if the starfish stays ashore, it's going to die. So the man says, there are hundreds of starfish. What difference can you, one little boy, make? He picks up the starfish and said, I made a difference to this starfish. So, uh, so surely for us, that's how it is at the Agar. Each child is so precious. Every day a child comes into a center, they are safe from physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. Each day a child comes, they get good food. Each day the child comes, they receive the love and warmth from the teachers. Each day a child comes, they're able to do different activities that helps their brain development. Every parent whom we sow those seeds of hope that you, your child too can go to school. Because migrant communities, they say, no, we are here for a few years, we'll go back, we know school will take our children. You know, so they don't even think that they can get an education for their children. So every parent where we sow those seeds of hope is precious for us, and that is success. Okay, so let's look at a few key takeaways. I've been speaking for uh, close to 40 minutes now. We started by saying that we discern God's call, but that is just the beginning. We step out in faith. So sorry. Thank you. We step out in faith. We follow it through with our actions or obedience. Hearing from God is not a one-time thing, right? It's constantly seeking him and his guidance. And when we serve, we pursue excellence. And we can pursue excellence only by pursuing personal growth. And on this journey, strengthen and encourage yourself in the Lord. Serving gives us an opportunity to bring him the glory and the honor. When I speak to people about the Agar, there is no other way to explain it but to talk about how and what God is doing. Every step of the way has been a miracle for us. It's like a medical miracle. When we started doing this COVID relief work, uh, there were, we, we got a large grant and that was a miracle. And uh, there were two organizations, two NGOs that uh, you know, we were partnering with and supporting their communities. So both of them asked me, you're such a young organization. You're so small. How did you get this grant? There was no other way to explain but to say it was the hand of the Lord. One of the corporates is, has recently started supporting one of our centers, and it's a startup that's now become a mid-sized organization. So they had come for the inauguration, and they were just talking to us about the challenges of starting an organization, running an organization, and uh, about working with migrant communities in particular. And so, you know, we were just sharing our experiences, and so this person says that you have Zen-like philosophy. And I said, no, you know, we just trust in the Lord, trust in God, believe that he has called us to do this and know that he will bring in the provision. Many a times I just say, Lord, you know, I know you'll bring the right people. This is your work. I know you'll bring the funds. You won't put these children back on the street, right? So truly it's just trusting him. I did a session for a group of women and uh, these are senior women who are looking to join NGO boards. So they're part of this program where they're learning the whole landscape, understanding NGOs. So a group had come to Diagar. They'd gone to one of our centers and they came and spoke to us and our team. And so one big question they had was, you know, asking me how did I make that move from the corporate to the social sector? 
there is no secular way of explaining that, right? Uh, my husband and I were working in California. I was working as an auditor, and he was in a startup, and we felt so strongly that God was calling us to come back to Bangalore in particular to work with children in communities, right? And so, you know, I was just sharing, saying this is what God asked us to do, and this is what we're doing. There is absolutely no other way to explain it. Some of the corporates I speak to when I'm, you know, doing the proposal, they ask me if I'm Christian, and this is in spite of my name. And, um, you know, so, you know, when we tell that this is what God is leading us to do, I think we're easily found out, right? Nobody else speaks like that. Uh, nobody else says God is leading me to do this. Uh, but for us, that is our life, that is our testimony, and we say that because we serve the one true living God. I would encourage you to get your 3D glasses on. When you're serving Christ, don't miss the supernatural. Put on your 3D glasses. When Jesus enters the scene, we can expect the extraordinary. And what a joy to be a part of the extraordinary that Jesus is doing. So put your 3D glasses on. This morning, would you listen to that still small voice? This morning, would you step out in faith? Will you put your feet in the water when it's still at flood stage? Will you expect to see the goodness of God? All glory and honor belongs to him. May everyone who sees the good work praise him in heaven. Father, we come before you this morning, Lord. We thank you that you have gathered us in your presence. We thank you, Father Lord, that you are the one true living God. We thank you that as, we are, as your children, we can hear your voice, Father. Thank you, Father Lord, that you are a God who speaks to us. You're a God who does the extraordinary through each one of us, Father. And this morning we pray, Lord, that faith would arise, Father. We pray, Father, Lord, that hearts would be stirred to step out into the water and to experience your goodness, Father. And through it all, Father, we lift your name on high, Father. We thank you, Father, Lord, that everything that we do points to you, Father, because we are walking in the supernatural, Father. We thank you that nothing can be explained, Father, any other way, but to point to you, Father, the one true living God. And through what you have called us to do, Father, we pray that hearts would turn to you, Father, and many people would experience this, this love and joy that we experience, Father. We thank you, Father, that you have called us, called us to serve you and your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.